Is it a dog or a ute? Who is linebacker one in this draft class and who's it going to end up being? What's going on with these small school guys who transferred to Western Kentucky and are now blowing up draft boards all over the universe? And what happens in the fallout for two prospects going in opposite directions that happen to catch passes down in Alabama? Welcome to Locked On NFL Draft. <laughs> You are Locked On NFL Draft, your daily podcast covering the NFL Draft. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another episode of Locked On NFL Draft. I'm your host, former NFL and NFL defensive back, Eric Crocker. And as always, I'm joined by my guy, Ryan Tracy. And we want to let you guys know that on location, it's the official hospitality partner of the NFL. It's the only place to score a once-in-a-lifetime Super Bowl ticket and experience package. Visit onlocationexp.com slash SB56 for more information or search Super Bowl on location. All right, man, we got some good stuff going today. We want to talk a little about some, you know, linebackers under the radar Guys, at a smaller school, but let's start with these linebackers, man. You have two really good ones that you wanted to kind of go over. Who is the LB1 for you right now at this moment? And two guys that kind of stand out to you. You got Devin Lloyd and Nicobe Dean from Georgia. So um, how are you feeling first about Devin Lloyd? You know, it happened again. I've been flipping this board back and forth all season long. And right now he's back up at number one. And they just keep trading off for me. And as we get more film in, the more we see them, I think, start to separate a little bit. And I think this is this is one of the key things right now in, in the college game coming up onto draft boards to get into the pros is how much can you do? We don't see a number of guys being taken to be two down linebackers anymore. It's got to be a more expanded role that you have to be able to stay on the field and be productive on the field both these guys do it but do it in different ways and that's what's been really messing with me this whole evaluation period and it, the 22 will sort that out but it's it's more about flavors now they can both defend the pass they're both instinctual but in in different ways and i think their production gives away some of those deals but right now for me it's Devin Lloyd back on top. We'll see what happens after the college football playoff and, and what happens with Dean because it could very well flip again. I don't know. When you look at, you know, Devin Lloyd, especially coming from a school like Utah, last year, I mean, we're, we're talking about somebody who's, he's a, a, a red shirt senior. So this isn't a guy that, you know, was, you know, projected or predicted to be a higher pick. You know, what mm -hmm. kind of went into him staying so long and how did he all of a sudden have kind of this spike in, where he's kind of viewed as a linebacker in the NFL. I think what you saw was a 2019 year where he played pretty solidly. And then a lot of craziness, obviously, with the 2020 season um, out there on the West Coast at Utah. It, it wasn't exactly consistent. I think he only had like 300 snaps on the season because of what they did back and forth with that conference, and et cetera, et cetera. But he played better. And I think he, it started to click for him. What I see on film now as, as that extended senior, is that there's more, I think, instinctualness. I think the game's gotten slower for him. Like, the things that you talk about a rookie doing, I've seen happen for him. And I do happen to get a lot of the West Coast games. So, like, it's been more of a consistent path for me to see his evolution. And I think that that's just it. It's like, you call him a late bloomer if you want, or, or call him needing to see more, more reps against varied offenses. I think that's really been the key for him because – I think he does lean more towards uh, defending the pass as, as his strength than maybe Dean does. And that's really the conundrum back and forth for me. I think he's ended up so far four interceptions on the season. Also had a guy that misses more tackles, particularly in the run game. So, like, you have balance there and you have to pick your poison. Do you have any issues with Devin Lloyd maybe coming from a smaller school and still being that LB1, not playing against the same type of competition or being challenged in the same way as a guy like uh, Nicobe Dean? No, for me, not necessarily. I'm trying to look like his his preseason schedule was, you know, Weaver State and San Diego State. But when you play in the Pac-12, I'm perfectly fine with that. I don't see the drop off, particularly anything particular to linebacker level from, from SEC to Pac-12 any more than you see with anybody else. It just 
at, it's it's different flavor. It's clearly not the same kind of physicality that you're expected to play with out there. Uh, so that lends itself again to being able to attack the run a little bit better from Dean, but maybe not being quite as good in space for Dean. So it is again, how does he fit into your defense? Are you trying to defend the pass first? We've seen a number of NFL teams go away from even emphasizing defending the run these days. So it's about fit within that group. And I think, honestly, I think they both have to play uh, with some help uh, for given their, their strengths and weaknesses. But I feel like right now the, the overall more rounded game is leaning towards Ward, uh, Lloyd for me. Well, and I mean, he flashed that in that Pac-12 uh, championship game where he mm -hmm. had that pick six, man. That was a huge play for him for Utah. Yeah, and that's the thing. You've seen him be close to that a couple of times in the past. And to put that together late in the season here, I think that that's key. We've seen Dean make some plays in the past game as well. Both of them show that that coverage instinct to plant their foot and come downhill. I think that's important. And I, it may be whoever makes the last play is going to get the nod for me. All right. Now, when you look at uh, N'Kobe Dean, do you – prioritize just him having to put the athleticism on full display a little bit more. Again, no slouches really in the Pac-12, but again, you're at Utah and you're not playing against like the elite running backs or, you know, you're not playing in space against big time receivers that are going outside of like, you know, Drake London. I think that's like one of the few receivers we talk about in the Pac-12. You know, you look at uh, N'Kobe Dean and who had he has had to play week in and week out and against the same, you know, the big office linemen in the South. And I, you know, I live in the South now, I get a different view and perspective of how big these office line more uh, line are and how much they prioritize that out here. You know, him kind of going against that, you know, has that do you think that has any benefits and how you're kind of looking at his draft stock? I, I think it does give him, especially when we're talking about his strength being against the run and dealing with with linemen and, and the size factor. That's true, especially because he is the smaller prospect. He's listed at six foot, so if he breaks five eleven, I'm gonna be really happy for him in his way. in. but uh, you know, whereas Lloyd is a six foot three list, you know, uh, about twelve pounds heavier. Like th there's more of a, a prototypical frame on Lloyd than there is on Dean. But Dean's proven that physicality. The question is going to be about longevity. It's going to be what is the toll of, of his college career taken out on him? Maybe that there's a projection there in the pros. I mean, I, I think they're both pretty low on snaps as you take a look at a career coming out at this point. So I, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of concern for either of them. All right. Awesome. Can't wait to dive more into both of these guys. Again, you got Utah's linebacker, Devin Lloyd and the Kobe Dean playing out of Georgia. But what I want to talk to you guys about is boost. All right. Boost mobile. And, you know, we all have our phones and, we, you know, we listen to a bunch of, you know, different podcasts, uh, some for power, some for knowledge, some for sports, you know, as you guys listen to this podcast right now. But, you know, you boost when you switch to Boost Mobile for the power of saving money because you're with Boost. Now you get, you know, the power of 5G on your phone. I have 5G uh, out here in the sticks and it works perfectly fine. Love the 5G network that I have. And now you can listen to all the latest episodes. All right, the power of three unlimited data lines for $30 a month per line. So your family can, you know, harness all that brand power too. And the power of one of America's 5G networks, one of the largest ones. So you can do all that of the speed with 5G. With all the money that you save, you'll get gain knowledge and power. What will you become with that? Switch to Boost Mobile and find out. All right, get a free Samsung Galaxy A32 5G when you switch to America's largest 5G networks. More power to save through Boost Mobile. Disclaimer, free phone limited to new customers and one per line. Additional restrictions apply. Offers coverage not available everywhere or for all phones networks. All right, you got to go to boostmobile.com to see all the details on that. And we also want to tell you guys that you know, we have good friends over at, gosh, I butchered that. What was it? This is a new one on location. I thought it was the Apple one. It's the, that one's the, the last one. Oh, is that? I think. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. On location. Apple is just oh. last. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right, here we go.
Also, we want to tell you guys about our good friends over at On Location. All right, the Super Bowl 56 at SoFi Stadium is less than 100 days away. And On Location, that's where you need to be going shopping to look for your tickets. All right, it's the official hospitality partner of the NFL and is the only place to score a once-in-a-lifetime Super Bowl ticket and experience package. Select your seats, you know, the exact seats that you want, and choose from elite experiences featuring an exclusive pregame celebration with the NFL legends, five-star L.A. hotels, and food by the great Wolfgang Puck. So visit the on-location exp.com slash SB56 for more information or Search up Super Bowl on location. That's on location, exp.com slash SB56. For, or search Super Bowl on location. All right, speaking of on location, we're going to get into talking about a couple guys in the location of Western Kentucky. A couple of prospects there, and they're kind of led by Zappy. Can, what can you kind of tell us about Zappy? I think he's a really, really interesting story. It's it, both he and Jared Stearns uh, and Jared Stearns' brother as well. They transferred from Houston Baptist, a tiny school. Yeah. One that like, quite frankly, from everything I've heard, and I've, I've found no film of this yet. <laughs> and you guys have probably heard Zappy's name. He's becoming more and more uh, in the spotlight here in this class. As, as the top end comes down, you're seeing uh, a lower prospect get pushed up, right? He made this transfer and, and, he stood out because he put up 5,000 yards, 52 touchdowns this season. There's a lot there. And a number of them go with his partner in crime, Jared Stearns, right? They played together at their previous school as well. So there was a, certainly a camaraderie. For those of you that like to watch, like, which teams like to put receivers with their old quarterbacks? There's three of them playing now in this rookie class. Like, that means something. That continuity, I think, really helps some guys. But for me, the thing that sticks out is, that jump to Western Kentucky, and that's still a moderately small school compared to some of the, the other schools that we're talking about the quarterback class coming from, there wasn't a drop-off. He did throw more interceptions by, by ratio, making that leap, but it, the consistency was there in terms of games played to yards thrown. So playing at, at such a lower level and then getting to, to WKU changes it Everything but the fact that he's still throwing the ball over the yard. He's still getting production out of his receivers. I think that bodes well for making another leap, and it's about controlling the things with his eyes that he hasn't been able to pick on at the lower levels. And maybe if he's a little bit more uh, pre-aware of where he shouldn't go with the ball, because I do like his kind of gunslinger attitude at times. If he can control his interceptions, I think he's a pro in the in the making that can be not only a serviceable back, a serviceable backup, but I think he is a guy that can start for a team in this league and get wins. Yeah. Now, you know, we see a guy we're talking about, he's not the biggest guy, you know, he's 6'1", 200, 220 pounds, so he's a little bit stocky, a little bit, uh, you know, thicker. Does he play more like a guy that, is more of a, I don't want to say like a statue in the pocket or, you know, does he move around well? What what kind of game does he have outside of just throwing the ball? I love his pocket presence. He moves within the pocket really well. He does break it from what the limited film that I've been able to see of him. It seems very comfortable. Like there doesn't seem to be that like, oh, oh I'm stepping into deeper water here when I leave the pocket. But it isn't like you're you're looking for a quote unquote running quarterback by any means. He's looking to deliver right. the ball downfield to the athletes, and that's my favorite thing about him is he just keeps you on your toes enough as a defense that you don't know what you're going to get out of him. And what about Stearns? Stearns is my guy. Stearns is my mighty mouse, um, my sleeper wide receiver that I think will continue. Both of these guys saw not only the jump to WKU as, as a plus, but they continue their production. I think they can do it again. He's a thick built guy that isn't, I would say a burner. He's got good speed. He's great in and out of his cuts. His routes are clean. He stems well. And I think he understands, particularly in what is more of a spread offense, how he can find the creases and be that guy that moves the chains consistently. I don't think he's going to be a deep threat in the NFL. That would be a stretch for me. But he is a guy that I can consistently work out of the slot grab you first downs, and every now and then pull something, especially against too high coverage. He works the middle really well, and I like that about him. Thickly built guy that can take a hit. Uh, I see a lot of upside for Jared Stearns. Yeah, you weren't lying about thickly built. <laughs> this guy's 5'9", <laughs> 195 pounds. So, yeah, 
big time size. You know, how has he looked to get, you know, has he does he look to struggle against certain type of competition? Or is he a guy that, you know, he could play in the inside as well as the slot? Is there a preferred uh, spot that they like to play him? He's played predominantly slot in all the film that I've seen. I think he's taken very few reps outside given by his pro football uh, snap count. So he is predominantly a slot. I think he handles the press well when he sees it, but clearly he's not getting it a whole lot. And I think he's very good at that initial kind of three-step range where he can get somebody on his heels because he's quicker off the ball than he appears. And it's not the deep speed. It's that that short area quickness that I think allows him to cross over guys quite a bit. And I, I like the routes that he runs. It's effective for him. And like you said, that's a lot of girth for a guy five foot nine. <laughs> Again, it might Almost be five eight. Like what it all comes yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, reminds me honestly of, of like a thicker Felton uh, that came out last year. Yeah. So, like, I think there's a lot of capability there. I'll be really interested to see what you think of his routes. Yeah, I can't wait to dive into those guys. And when we come back right now, we're going to talk a little bit about Alabama. We had an injury there, and you know, the John Mechie, and we're going to talk about how that may impact his draft status. But first, I want to talk to you guys about Beach bound all right in life we are all bound for different things you know with beachbound.com you know vacations you can you know be bound for an adventure bound for passion bound for discovery or bound for togetherness with your significant other are bound for immersion bound for rejuvenation or maybe you know you bound for encountering the unexpected so personally me when i'm at a beach resort I'm bound to end up poolside at a bar, you know, creating my own taco flight as long as I've got good food, a good view, and a good drink in my hand. I'll be happy as can be. And with beachbound.com, you can find the perfect beach location for you. No matter what it is that you're looking for, or, you know, you take your family and everything like that, you know, you guys have to ask this question to yourself. What are you bound for? Whatever that is, visit beachbound.com right now let's talk about some guys that are potentially bound for the nfl you know alabama they have a couple of just really super explosive receivers out there you got john mechie you got oh man jameson williams i love jameson <laughs> williams um everything i've seen from him but mechie was kind of the forgotten guy we talked a lot about him last week how you know he was the one guy we were looking to see you know, what he does, you know, with the opportunity, you know, does he take that next step? Does he step it up? You know, where does he win? And in the midst of having another terrific game, being able to, you know, stretch the field vertically, you know, work inside, work outside. He also had an injury towards ACL. So, you know, how do you think an injury like that will potentially affect his draft stock? Because that's something that either can have him out. I mean, well, we're talking about six to nine months, so he wouldn't even be ready until what potentially training camp. So, does he just go back to college, or do you think he enters the draft? That's that's the big call. I I would think, given his season, and given what else you've seen from Alabama this year, meaning that it's been a one and two man show. It's been Mechie and Williams, and that's been about it. I don't see a whole lot of more support immediately for him. That's worth going back to school now some guys are able to recover from acls a little bit faster these days we've seen some four-month timelines that kind of thing i don't know that you can you can count on that in, in this situation i think the worst thing about this injury is when it happened if this happens a month ago it's a completely different story in terms of his outlook i think it does drop him down um clearly i, I think I, I he's gonna end up in the top 10 wide receivers in, in the class it's still my thought right now but you can't put a first round investment in that kind of player that you may not see not only all the OTAs, it will severely degrade his evolution as a, as a rookie in general, uh, in my opinion. So I, I think that drops him down a bit, but I certainly a top 75 selection in my opinion still. See, and that's my issue because I think he's a guy that potentially could be, you know, either a first or, you know, potentially in the early uh, day two guy, especially with, mm -hmm. you know, seeing how well he runs, but, you know, with an injury like this, he's going to miss that timing. And he's not going to have the opportunity to, uh, you know, do the testing that will potentially, you know, boost his stock. So I, I just, I feel like he has to come back for another yeah. year, you know, unless yeah. he doesn't care, you know, if he doesn't mind, like, okay, well, potentially, because I think an injury like this can maybe like drop him to like a day three pick. Oh, you think? And, okay. Yeah. You know, he's coming off a torn ACL. He's already, you know, I think he has a good game inside, outside, but. 
I, I think, you know, healthy day two, but man, coming in and especially now, like guys are going to, you know, it's a, what can you do for us right now type thing. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't, I'm not liking it. I'm not liking it coming off of an ACL unless he was a guy who, you know, showed just all this blazing speed and pure ability consistently and people weren't going to worry about those things. I would, I would come back. Look at last year, right? You had Jalen Waddle. He had this bad ankle injury. He was coming. He came back in the national championship game. He's limping around because it's like, no, nah, I'm going to show guys like, no, I'm, I'm not far off. This is me right now. I'm going to be, you know, further yeah. along once this whole thing heals. I need, you know. So, I mean, even that was fun. He came back from that. But Mechie, I, I don't know. Well, it's, let me ask you this, though, because you hit a, a really important point. Because I think this makes a difference in the evaluation. You said inside, outside. Where do you see him lining up in the NFL? Is there a position or is he a, a three-spot wide receiver? I think more of a slot. Yeah. I think he's more of a slot. Now, again, you – that's not a, a, a knock in today's NFL because it's almost going positionless mm -hmm. where guys aren't, they don't have to just be this pure outside X alpha receiver. You know, you can be more of a, you know, a smaller slot and still, you know, have value to a team. So I don't think it matters if he's outside, inside. I think they're still going to, you know, I think he's still going to be somebody who people, uh, no, still value when healthy, but right now clearly he's not that. I tend to think that as well, and it's funny because I just I, I want to point this out because you brought up Waddle, similar situation. Obviously, was able to return right. Waddle's number two in the rookie wide receivers right now in terms of yardage. He's what just behind Elijah Moore for tied with his teammate with Smith for third in, in touchdown production as a rookie. So clearly the timeline didn't hurt him. He runs mostly out of the slot. I think it's like going on 60% slot routes for him. So like, is that a model that you could follow with Mechie to, to, to really say Jalen did it? Why can't I? Uh, Jalen Waddle had a different kind of speed, at least to yeah. my knowledge, because I, you know, obviously he didn't run his 40, but we did see like this. It was Jalen Waddle versus, uh, Henry Ruggs race and they were neck and neck. So I'm like, okay, he's blazing. But then I hear guys like Chris Sims. Chris Sims is like, oh, doesn't have that pure outside speed. And I'm like, wait, what? Like this dude looks hella fast. <laughs> but uh, so I don't think Mechie has that type of speed, but definitely has the speed to be able to win vertically. So you know, I, I don't, I don't foresee an issue with him being able to play inside outside, but definitely more slot. Will he be as explosive as Waddle out of the slot? Not sure about that, but. I think right. he'll translate very well to the NFL, you know, especially for, you know, his ability to run routes from that area. Don't think it'd be an issue. And I do think one thing that Alabama receivers, what kind of maybe helps their transition is, you know, the, vers the versatile play calling. They run the NFL routes in college. You know, they do the motioning down to stacks and all these different movement things pre-snap. You're not seeing that from a lot of different colleges. So I think that helps prepare these guys for the NFL level as well. Yeah, that's a good point. So on the flip side, what does that do for Jamison Williams? Because without having his his running partner there, we've seen him have this explosive season, and he's still got a couple games ahead of him, right? Like, like there's going to be that college playoff. To put the cap on his season, does he need Mechie out there? Like, does his game suffer because he doesn't have another target to share load with? I mean, you would think that, you know, colleges and some of these teams would roll coverage towards him, but – I don't think it's going to matter. I mean, we saw him run by <laughs> double coverage in the last game for a touchdown. So, dude, just so explosive. And I think, it's, you know, you don't have to utilize him just one way. He's not a guy mm. where it's just like, okay, you're just outside, just run a go route. Or, okay, outside, run a dig route. So, you know, we could bracket that. He can catch a slant and take that to the house. So, I don't think it's going to hurt him at all, you know, having to really carry just the full load and, and not have that other big-time receiver opposite him. I think Bryce Young's playing at an extremely high level as well. So I don't think it's going to hurt the protection of Williams right now. So man, I'm really excited about him. Now I want to see, do they still leave him on special teams? Because that's uh -huh. the part where, uh, you know, he's been playing special teams and obviously he got kicked out of a game for a targeting penalty. Do you still risk that? Do you risk the in injury aspect of him running down, covering punts uh, when you don't have that other explosive, you know, receiver that can really carry you in the game. So, uh, losing Mechie will hurt. Not sure that it'll help Williams in his uh, protection. Yeah, I think I'm with you. It's interesting. We'd like to know what you guys think. If you'd leave us comments over on the YouTube channel or in the iTunes reviews, that would certainly help. 
We appreciate you guys taking your time to hang out with us. And E, I don't know. It's starting to get we gotta we, we gotta dig in a little bit more because every time I watch a prospect, I see like two other ones, and I'm like, I gotta go back and watch him now too. So it's getting to that time of year. Yeah, and I gotta start watching some more of these these guys that we talked about today. Devin Lloyd, Utah. Definitely want to see, you know, what's the hype about. I watched the game, but I wasn't watching him through the eyes of let me evaluate this prospect. Saw the pick six and how big of a moment that was. But, you know, guys like Zappy and Stearns and some of these other guys, like I can't wait to start to dive into those guys so I can have more detail, detailed analysis on those guys. But uh, we want to thank you guys for rocking with us and thank you for making us your first listen of the day. After you listen to this, make sure you guys listen to Locked On 49ers with myself, Brian Peacock, and listen to Locked On Chiefs with our guy, Ryan Tracy. But... Till next time, we are out. Peace.